For the rest of this course, we are going to assume rationality on the part of consumers. So it's appropriate to spend just a few minutes talking about to what extent that's a good assumption. As I mentioned before, it uh, perhaps was a fairly good assumption if you were in the 1880s and trying to come up with a scientific theory of human behavior to use to make economics into a science, which is what the the founders of neoclassical economics were trying to do. But from the perspective of the 21st century, this rationality assumption seems to be rather weak. I'd first like to talk about an, an example of this. It's, um, and it's an experiment which was carried out by a professor of psychology from Stanford University. I'll write his name down. Shiv. And the experiment went like this. You had two groups of students and they were told that this was an experiment about memory. Now it actually wasn't an experiment about memory. Uh, psychologists fairly often don't reveal the true purpose of an experiment to the people who participate in it. That's a difference from economists. There are a few economists that do experiments, and typically when they do, they tell the students what the experiment is about. In any case, the students were told that, that this was an experiment about memory. Half the students were asked to, to memorize a two-digit number. The other half of the students were asked to memorize a seven-digit number. They were in a room and they were asked to leave the room, go down a long hallway, go to another room, and in this other room was a, a person working in the experiment who would ask them what the number is. So in other words, they would start in this room, end in that room, and they had to memorize the number and keep it in their mind as they were walking along the passageway from 1 to 2. But unbeknownst to them, what would actually happen is as they were walking on the passageway between 1 and 2, they would be met by another person working for the experimenter. And that person would say, we are really grateful to you for taking part in our experiment. And so we'd like to offer you a, a free gift of some food. Here I've got uh, two plates. One on one plate is chocolate cake, and on the other plate is a fruit salad. Which one would you like to take? And so then the student would choose, and they would get either the chocolate cake or the fruit salad, and then they continue on their way to room two and report the number. What was interesting about this experiment is there was a huge difference between the food choice made by the people who are asked to memorize a two-digit number and the people who are asked to memorize the seven-digit number. The people who are asked to, to memorize the two-digit number, which is actually a pretty easy thing to do, right? Remember something like 43? Most of those people went for the fruit salad. But the people who were trying to keep a seven digit number in their mind while they were walking between rooms one and two went mostly for the chocolate cake. So why is that? Well in psychology it's now understood that the brain is not just one uniform thing. There are different parts of the brain that have different functions and do different things. And one of the conflicts between the chocolate cake and the fruit salad is that chocolate cake isn't very healthful for you and fruit salad is a lot more healthful. On the other hand, our brains are often programmed to really like the sweetness and the fat content of chocolate cake. So chocolate cake is very tempting. The idea is that 
One part of the brain is called the limbic system. And it's a more primitive part of the brain. Another part of the brain is called the prefrontal cortex. And it's charged with more higher order abstract reasoning. Basically, when you're asked to memorize a seven digit number, the prefrontal cortex is really, really busy. It's desperately trying to remember all those seven digits. And uh, so all your brain's resources are going to the, uh, the, the prefrontal uh, cortex. Um, and, and the prefrontal cortex really can't do anything else. It, it just, it's, all it can do is memorize these seven digits. So when you get the choice of the chocolate cake or the fruit salad, the prefrontal cortex can't handle that choice because it's busy doing something else, remembering the number. So the part of the brain that handles the choice is the limbic system, which says, I'm going to go for that chocolate cake because it tastes really good. So the people that are asked to memorize a seven-digit number have prefrontal cortexes that are being overwhelmed, and therefore the prefrontal cortex really can't stop the brain from listening to the limbic system and so the brain listens to the limbic system it just goes with chocolate cake. On the other hand, if you're only asked to memorize a two-digit number, the prefrontal cortex has a lot of free computing power left over because memorizing two digits is really quite easy. So the people who were asked to memorize a two-digit number and then get this choice between chocolate cake and fruit salad, the prefrontal cortex can think about what that means, decide, yeah, sure, I know the limbic system is going to say go for the chocolate cake, but that's not a healthful choice, and the prefrontal cortex will take, will take over, will overrule the limbic system, and tell the person to go for the fruit salad. So this idea that the brain has different parts that can be in conflict with each other is, of course, completely different from the simple neoclassical idea of rationality, which is that a brain just does one thing. Uh, literally, uh, people have only one mind. Well, actually, in some sense, people don't have just one mind. They have more than one mind. And so the, w what, what we've learned since the 1880s is that the human brain is actually a lot more complicated than the standard rationality assumption would lead one to believe. Another person whose work I want to talk about is Daniel Gilbert. He's a psychology professor at Harvard. And he's done quite a few experiments related to whether people correctly anticipate the results of their decisions. So when we write a utility function u of x and y, what we're saying is that if you get a certain amount of x and a certain amount of y, you know that your utility is going to be a certain amount. But what Gilbert has shown is that when people get x and y, often the amount of utility they enjoy is different than what they think they're going to enjoy. In other words, people aren't very good judges of their utility function. One of the most important contexts in which he's done this is situations where either really good things happen to people or really bad things happen to people. Uh, suppose you consider lottery winners. People think that if they win the lottery, the utility is so lottery winner. They they think that the, their utility is really going to go up a lot, but if you actually study lottery winners, especially you know not in the first day or two after they win the lottery, but after about a year, you find that yes, their utility goes up, but it doesn't go up by nearly as much as what they they thought it would. On the other hand, think about people who get very ill. Let's say people have cancer or maybe have to have a limb amputated. They tend to think that their utility is going to go down a lot. And other people think so too, that their, their utility is going to go down a lot. And indeed, people who are in bad health or have had a limb amputated do have uh, lower levels of happiness than, than, uh, than lots of other people. But it does not really that much lower. It's only a little bit lower. So in other words, what Gilbert, Gilbert's research has shown is that people seem to have some sort of 
utility set points, which actually doesn't change very much when they have good fortune or bad fortune. It changes some, but it changes much less than what they think. And so people think when they buy, if, if they got a chance to buy a new big screen TV that it's going to make them a lot happier, but actually it's only going to make them a little happier. So people regularly misjudge the effect of commodities and other things, but we're talking here about commodities, on utility. And therefore, this utility function is not well understood even by the consumers themselves. Now, having said this, what we're studying in this class is standard neoclassical economics, which ignores all of this, which goes back to rationality. And so we're not going to be discussing these kinds of things for the rest of the semester. But there's some hope that in a few decades from now, these kind of insights might be more fully incorporated into economics and we can have a more realistic uh, theory of human behavior and, uh, and, and human psychology. Final issue to address here is whether utility is cardinally measurable. Are only ordinarily measurable. I said when I was talking about this, the um, experience by Gilbert, I referred to people being more happy and less happy, and by how much. The idea that you can measure how happy a person is, and you can say things like, they expected to be a lot happier when they got the big screen TV, but only they were a little bit happy when they got the big screen TV. That's an assumption that utility is cardinally measurable, which means you can have, you can measure utility like utility equals two or utility equals three, and you could say that three is one and a half times two. An orderly measurable quantity is something where you can say that it's gotten bigger or smaller, but the notion of how much bigger or how much smaller doesn't make sense. Most economists still assume that utility is just ordinarily measurable. It's not cardinally measurable. So we can say whether you prefer A to B or B to A or you're indifferent, but you can't say by how much you prefer A to B. But so here, here, here's an example. Take uh, uh, take temperature. Uh, temperature is not cardinally measurable in the same way that apples are cardinally measurable. If you compare, let's say, a temperature of 32 degrees Fahrenheit to a temperature of 64 degrees Fahrenheit, it doesn't make any sense to say that 64 degrees Fahrenheit is twice as hot as 32 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, one easy way to see that is because there's nothing particularly good about the the uh, the Fahrenheit use of Fahrenheit to measure temperatures. T1 is also 0 degrees Celsius. 64 is, um, I'm not sure what degrees Celsius 64 is, but the point is it's certainly not twice zero because twice zero is still zero. So T2 isn't twice as hot as T1 on the Celsius scale, and so saying that it's true on the Fahrenheit scale really doesn't tell you anything about temperature. So the position of very early economists that is pre-1900 and the position of modern day psychologists is that utility is cardinally measurable. There is some sense in which you can measure how happy people are and say that uh, you can do interpersonal comparisons, that is, that one person is happier than another person, and you can say that, that they are uh, maybe less happy than they thought they were going to be. Whereas the position of most neoclassical economists is that utility is only ordinarily measurable, and so we'll be able to say things like u1 is greater than u2, or u2 is greater than U1, or they're equal, but we're not going to be able to add utilities, subtract utilities, multiply utilities, divide, do anything like that because of lack of being cardinally measurable.
So for the rest of the semester, we'll take the standard neoclassical position, which is that utility is only ordinally measurable. It's not cardinally measurable.